All right, everyone, today we have yet another A2238 MacBook Pro that does not turn on. So let's go ahead and um, open this up and let's see what's going on here. Okay, so we have our bottom case off and uh, right off the bat, I see some areas of just minor liquid, um, like on the heat sink, we have some drops and on the fan, but nothing really too serious, at least in my opinion, so far. So let's go ahead and uh, plug this in. Now, we're still kind of learning about these M1 machines and how they present on USB amp meters, so uh, this will be yet another learning experience here. So plug in our USB uh, amp meter. Looks like we're getting 5 volts and 0 0.03 milliamps. Now, on the previous machines, on the T2 machines, that could mean PP bus G3 hot is missing. So I'm going to go ahead and check PP bus G3 hot. Now, you could guess where it's at, and I could tell you from the fact that the fuse right here is going to be where PP bus G3 hot is. But thanks to somebody on the Bad Caps forum that created a board view from scratch on this, we don't have to do that anymore. So let's go ahead and open up a board view for an 820 uh, motherboard. And let's see if I was right on my guess here. So let's go to my board view. And what do you know? PP bus AON. Oh, okay. So we're not calling it uh, PP bus G3 hot anymore. We're calling it PP bus AON. Now this makes more sense than G3 hot because, you know, when you're, when you, you know, what the hell does G3 hot mean? You know what I mean? AON is an acronym. It stands for always on. So A for always and then on. So PP bus AON does make more sense than calling it PP bus G3 hot because, you know, PP bus G3 hot really doesn't make too much sense. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and measure what we have here. I have no idea what the voltage should be here. I'm going to guess around 13 volts. So let's measure right here. And we have 12.28, and it's cycling really fast. Now, that typically happens when we have a short downstream. So at this point, we've got to unplug our battery. And we've got to pull our board and see what's going on here. So I'm going to unplug my battery. Now, I believe these will not start without the battery. So that could challenge things. But I just want to see what PPBus does when uh, just the charger is plugged in. So again, same amp meter reading. And 12.28 cycling. So what's probably going on is there's a short somewhere, somewhere. And when whatever that shorted is turning on, it's pulling down PP bus voltage. Then it goes up, and then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down. Anyway, let's get this board out, and let's go from there. All right here, so here's our board. Um, we have some minor areas of corrosion. I mean, nothing's overly bad. This is my main concern right here. This is the 3V8 AON generator. Now, I've worked on these boards before, and I know for a fact these guys can take out both CDs somehow, I don't know how yet, and the special thing about this guy is it can actually take out our PMICs which power the CPU. Um, this is a corroded speaker amp, um, that's not too much of a concern. This is our ISL, that looks fine, I mean it looks corroded but that's salvageable. Now let's talk about 3V, uh, 3V8 AON. So on these new boards, instead of having 12 volts driving our CPU, what we have is 3V8 driving two PMICs, a master and a slave PMIC. So I believe one primarily powers the RAM, one primarily powers the SOC. Um, so this is our 3V8 uh, AON generation circuit. So on these coils are all for 3V8. They're, they're on different power states. Here's our PMIC. This is going to power our SOC, which is under here. And then here's our other PMIC, which I believe powers our RAM primarily and NANs and a few other things. Here's our NANs right here. So I do like that these guys are under a shield because that that kind of keeps them from getting wet. Um, not fully, but it, it definitely stops it. Water does not like to go through uh, tiny holes like that unless it's fully submerged, so it does spare them a little bit. Now these guys look great. Let's go ahead and look at the schematic for the 3V8 AON circuit and let's see how this can fail and what's going on here. So I'm going to open up my board view again and we are going to go over to, uh, let's see, what component is this? This is going to be U5700. So I'm going to um, open up my schematic for U5700, and we could see that this is our 3V8 AON controller. Um, let's see here. Is this the right one? Yes, here we go. All right. So let's open up window capture for our schematic.
And there we go. Okay, so here's our 3V8 A1 controller. We can see it takes PP bus in and it sends out um, PP 3V3 A1. Now this is going to drive a few MOSFETs here. Not visible on this page of the schematic, which is a little bit odd because usually they are. Um, but, you know, that's why I kind of think these boards are a little bit engineered a little bit differently. Um, or engineered by a different company. So anyway, we have a few MOSFETs here. Um, and these guys send out PP3B3 AON and a bunch of other ones. There's, um, yeah, there's PP3B8 AON, there's 3V8 AON, um, uh, it looks like V return. This is an output as well. So yeah, it's a little bit weird going on here, but um, here's our circuit here. So this is what U5700 is going to be driving. Now, it is much safer for the PMIC to have a low voltage going into it and get um, its source voltage rather than um, full-on PP bus into it. So, I mean, I guess we could still get PP bus in here if this MOSFET shorts, but at least it won't kill our CPU because our CPU has no uh, source to PP bus. It just has 3V8 AON. Um, so it's not going to uh, have much of a um, effect if, if one of these MOSFETs does short. It'll kill the PMIC, but the PMIC is probably not going to pass 12 volts to our CPU, so that is an improvement there. Anyway, we don't know if that's our issue yet. I kind of like to solve for corrosion, but I want to start taking some measurements here. So 3V8 is AON means always on. Let's measure what we get on these coils right over here. Um, so it looks like we have basically three AON lines, SW3, SW2, and SW3. Let's check both of these guys with our charger plugged in. So I'm going to plug in a USB-C board. And we're going to measure voltage here. So 3V8 AON does a lot of different things, and one of those things is powering our SOC. So PP bus was cycling to 12.2 volts and 12.3 uh, volts. And what we know on the previous models, and um, when PP bus is 12.3 volts, that means the T2 isn't running. Now the T2 is integrated into the SOC in this case. And I'm getting 3.2. 3.8 volts, but it's cycling, going up and down. So that's a little bit concerning. I don't know if that's normal or not. Yeah, so it's ci it's cycling up and down. So that that's a bit odd here. Okay. So this chip is theoretically doing its job um, because it's basically sending out PP3V3AON. Now this chip is a very rare specimen. You cannot really get these, and the ones that I have seen are like. $80. So we're going to try and save this because I don't want to have to replace this if it's still good. Um, if the chip is still sending out its voltage, now I briefly had an M1 Air um, that I purchased to make some measurements and I did observe that cycling behavior when the device was in sleep mode only. Um, so I don't know if these are basically in sleep mode if it's with everything unplugged. I don't know that. Um, but we're going to give this a shot. So I'm going to clean up the visible corrosion with Q-tip and alcohol, and then I'm going to go ahead and flux and heat that. Now, when I'm thinking of other issues this may have, I'm thinking of shorts. Um, there's a few capacitors here that look terrible. So I'm going to kind of just probe around. Uh, the first one I'm going to check is around this Wi-Fi. Um, because we're not pulling really enough amp draw to be able to read or to be able to use our thermal imager here but let's see what line this cap is on right here so this is on PP3V3 S2 WLBT um, so that's for our Wi-Fi Bluetooth whatever um, so let's go ahead and see if there's a short here because like I said that cycling voltage can be a symptom of a short at least on previous generation boards. And what do you know? I have a dead short to ground here. And look at this. The capacitor literally just flaked apart. Look at that. Look at that. It just flaked apart. That's amazing. You can even see where it cracked the underfill. So I'm pretty sure this is going to be our problem right here. Look at that crack around that underfill. That's amazing. Anyway, let's go ahead and get rid of you. So we are going to flick you off and flick you off. Come on gonna end up ripping a pad. We don't want that. Or do we want that? I don't know. Anyway, don't want to do that. So let me go ahead and get my iron. And we are just gonna say goodbye to all of these guys. 
Now, here's another concern I have with these devices. The SOC has a integrated heat spreader. Now, there's thermal paste under that, and for ultrasonic, um, ultrasonic, um, there's a chance that it can degrade the thermal paste. Now, it probably won't remove all of it, but it can degrade it. So, that's a concern, and I think what we're going to do here, we need to do some research on ultrasonic times, but most likely, um, we're not going to recommend more than two minutes per side, uh, compared to our usual uh, three to four minutes a side on other devices. So, we're just going to get rid of this. I'm not going to use hot air around here because this is an underfilled area and that would be not very smart to do that and I don't want to ruin the Wi-Fi chip. So I'm going to get rid of you. Just like that. All you guys are gone. Now we're going to clean this area up with a little alcohol. And we'll put these guys back in a minute, but I just want to clean this up. And let's see if we still have a short here. And of course, my luck, especially this week, the Wi-Fi chip is going to be shorted. But let's not hope for that. No more short. All right. I don't want to turn this board on yet because there's still a lot of junk on it. So I'm going to flux and heat anything I see that's corroded. Um, the speaker ramp is probably fine. All this stuff, it doesn't look terrible. I mean, they, there's corrosion, but it's not super terrible corrosion. So... This is, m okay, I track that. Yeah, that's not that bad, that'll clean up too. Yeah, most of the stuff will be fine after ultrasonic cleaning. So let's go ahead and flux these CD32 17s and clear all this junk around them. Same with this area and this guy right here. Basically, anywhere where I see corrosion, I'm going to put uh, some flux down. And that flux is going to dissolve that corrosion, and it's going to rejuvenate any uh, broken solder joints that are under the areas that are corroded. So I'm going to get my hot air. Now, the CPU is underfilled on this, so we have to be careful. But hopefully an underfilled CPU will stop the monkeys that think it's a good idea to use a Wagner on a CPU. Because if you use a Wagner on an underfilled CPU, you're going to have a really nice surprise. So the pins on this guy looks pretty good. So I'm not too concerned there about the long-term function of that chip. Same with these, these look fine. This, the corrosion under there is just gonna be superficial. So there's that. I'm being really gentle around the Wi-Fi chip. Now, you may be wondering, why don't you just put the board in the ultrasonic? Well, what's going to happen is all these solder joints that are corroded are just going to fall apart. And when we use flux and heat, they are going to, they're basically going to be re-soldered. And that's going to prevent damage in the ultrasonic cleaner. So if I were to take this and put it in the ultrasonic cleaner without doing this, we're going to have issues. But this is going to prevent that because it's going to, one, clear the corrosion, dissolve it, make it easier for the ultrasonic cleaner to clear and it's going to kind of rebuild those broken solder joints that are under these chips from the corrosion. All right, I think that's good for this side. Let's flip it over, and I just touch the flux, and I have flux all over my hand now. I hate when I get flux on my hand, but that's part of this job, I guess. So what do we have on this side? This guy's concerning because I think this one's some ROM type thing. Let's see. This is current sensing. Okay, I don't care about you. I do care about you, but you're just a sensor. All you do is report 
a measurement to the SOC. And then if it reports a way out of line reading, it will throttle the CPU. But we'll worry about that if we have CPU throttling here. I do believe these M1 machines are going to be very fixable uh, for liquid damage. Um, I don't think they're a terrible machine. I personally think the whole screen cracking on their own is total BS um, because anybody that's been in this industry knows that people make up stuff like that. Just like with warranty claims, you have people that say, oh, I, I just I had my computer fixed to you and now the screen is cracked. What happened? Well, what happened is you probably dropped it down a flight of stairs and now you want your money back and you're not going to get it because you dropped it down a flight of stairs. Um, that's the kind of thing that that customers do. So if you buy a, a you know a two thousand dollar machine and you break the screen on it, yeah, you're gonna say, oh, it cracked on my own. It cracked on its own. Well, not quite. So the all these new M1 machines are nothing really new, and they pretty much use the same screens that they have since 2018. So I don't really see a new defect coming up on a screen that's been in use for already many years. Um, now without it with with that being said, these screens are fragile. I will say that. These screens are very fragile. Um, so you can break these screens very easily. I mean, if you want a durable laptop, do not buy one of these new MacBooks because they are not the slightest bit durable. You bump that screen on a door, anything carrying it, that screen is probably done. So I'm just cleaning up this trackpad connector. There's no need to replace it. This guy at the end doesn't look too good. I know I have bridges. I'm just just cleaning it up. I don't care about having bridges right now. I just want to get all that corrosion out of here and, and these pins restored. Get a little bit of acetone in here. Acetone really cleans flux so much better than isopropanol. You want to be careful around plastics, um, but otherwise acetone is much, much better at isopropanol. Much, I mean, much better than isopropanol cleaning flux. Acetone just seems to eat it away when isopropanol just kind of smears it. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue here. The one pin that is concerning me a bit is that one at the end. Let me open my board view real quick and let's see what this goes to. PP bus, all right, so we have a lot of PP bus pins here. If we have one, we're going to be all right but I want to see if I can restore this. Nope, that is gone. So what I'm going to do is just bridge this to the next one. So all these here are PP bus pins. So let's see all until, let's see, which one of these is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. All right, so the first four pins are all PP bus. And they actually have... Okay, what's ACT ground? I've never seen that. Most likely that's just a ground coming from internal from a chip. All right, so our first four pins are PP bus, and then the rest are this ACT ground, whatever that is, and then our signal lines are nice separated from our high voltage lines. That's very good, but anyway. So one, two, three, four. These are all PP bus. These are the ACT ground. So let's get more flux in here. I'm just going to try and bridge this guy because that's essentially going to make our connection there. Uh, 
That should carry plenty of current there. A little worried about the condition of that pin. So let me see here. Let's see what I can do. There, that's good. These guys look good. We have another bridge on this side. Again, that's just on PP bus. Um, I could really let that be, but I'm going to remove it just for the sake of somebody calling me unprofessional in the YouTube chat, which happened before. Because I used a thermal camera, somebody interpreted using a thermal camera as unprofessional, which was absolutely hilarious. But it is what it is. Well, some of these other pins are a little bit nasty looking too, so I'm just going to touch them up. There's that. And the rest of these look good. Let me just make sure I don't have any important bridges. So I'm going to clean this up. I can't really see it. This is acetone. One really helpful tool I like is just syringes with um, hypodermic needles because that pointy tip is really helpful uh, uh, on some things and it helps you, uh, you know, just put the right amount of acetone or isopropanol wherever you need it without doing anything. Now this right here, what was this? So this looks like it was a diode that I might have knocked off there. I have to look there. So what were you? Okay, so let's see what this guy does keyboard interrupt diode this is a zener diode we're gonna try and find one of these to put back now the board would work just fine without one of these but um, we're gonna want to replace this just to um, just as an, another safety measure that's just there um, just as a protection measure and we'll put it back but we'll come back to that in a minute here Let's check for any bridges on this side. Nope, looks good. All right, carrying on. Uh, what was our other thing that I was concerned about? Oh yeah, right, this guy right here. So weird. What's weird about these uh, new boards is you know, like a Zener diode. And that's not like Apple, at least not on these boards. That's good. All right, so diode and then we're done. All right, I'm going to very carefully place this guy because these are super fragile. Just a little piece of silicon, that's it. And this is a very small component. No, oh, come on. All right, now I'm gonna heat. Now, we have a connector right here, so we're gonna have to use a lower temperature. So I'm going to go for 250, uh, 258. This is blurry.
Just like that. Look at that. Not even any connector melty. Perfect. We actually melted our solder on our connector too, so it even looks better. Cool. Gotta love that. Alright, let's go ahead and see if this works now. So I am going to let it cool down, and then we're going to plug it in and see if we get any different voltage readings. Now, I believe these will not get 20 volts that are battery connected, so we're going to take that in mind. Alright, so we're going to plug it in now. Hopefully we get something different, because we got 5 volts before. Let's see what we get. Hmm, nothing. Let's replug it. My USB, my test USB-C board might be a little bit bad too. There we go. 20 volts, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Give me something else, come on. For all I know, it's actually booting because these things are so efficient. Yeah, we're going to, no, yep, 0 0.25, that is booting. 0 0.66, we're definitely booting now, and our heat sink is getting hot. That's a good sign. Let's try this other port. Now, I'm a l I, I kind of think it's my port. Yeah, it's just my, it just gave me a, yeah, it's just my lousy port, that's all. All right, let's get this back in the enclosure and let's see if it actually works in boots. Now it's really time for us to hope that our CPU is not dead because that is a backlight pin and that is a data pin that Apple still has not fixed. So here's our backlight pin and here's our data pin. It's still right next to each other and this definitely probably crossed a voltage. So that's not a good thing. Let's see how bad the enclosure looks. Yeah, that doesn't look very good at all. I mean, I've seen worse, but that doesn't look good. But I think it might just have lived. Clean that up. Do not plug a board into this before you clean this up. You will have a very nice dead CPU on your hand. So we definitely had a little arcing right there to ground. You can see the little hot spot there. So we're going to hope that our M1 is more durable than our Intel CPUs and did not die because if this was an Intel uh, CPU, this probably would be totally dead. So we'll see here. Now, we also don't want to forget that our trackpad cable was connected. I mean, our trackpad connector was corroded, and that also means our trackpad cable is going to be corroded. So these usually aren't as bad, um, and we probably shouldn't need to replace these. This should be able to just clean this up really nicely. Don't plug a corroded cable back into a connector you just restored. You don't want to ruin it. Get back here, little pin. That's all right. You're all on the same line, so it doesn't matter. It's got a little melty there, but I think we're all right. Let's go ahead and clean this up. I believe these are the same cables as the 2289 and 2251. I'm not sure yet. I haven't tried it. So worst case, I could always just replace it, but why waste a good cable? I don't, put a, I don't want to put acetone on this flux because I don't want it to ruin it. Okay, so this end pin might be ground. Yeah, that's separated. So that's not touching. So we should be all right. I'll probably put a little drop of conformal coat there. But we'll see. All right, now for a moment of truth. Let's see if this actually boots. So 20 volts, 0 0.08, 0 0.014. I'm not getting a trackpad click yet. So our trackpad may be bad or need a new cable. But that is an Apple logo. Look at that. That is an Apple logo. Yeah, I'm probably just going to replace this trackpad cable. But let's see if this boots into an operating system. It is in recovery mode. 
probably can't see that. All right, so our trackpad actually works, um, but uh, the uh, actuator isn't working right. So our trackpad is functional, but our actuator is not working. So this probably needs to do trackpad, um, but it still beats buying a new machine. So yeah, our these all on all new Macs since like 2015, uh, the trackpad actually doesn't have a button. It's just a electromagnetic um, actuator that makes you think you're pressing a button. So the trackpad otherwise is fully functional on this machine, just the actuator doesn't work. So let's see. Come on, boot into an operating system. Do I get caps lock light? Mm, not yet. All right. All right, that is booted. Now, hopefully I have keyboard. I do have keyboard. Cool. All right, so a new thing on M1s. They will not give caps lock light until they're in the OS. So, yeah, this is fixed. Uh, we'll go ahead and take care of that trackpad issue. That's boring off-stream stuff. Um, but, yeah, this should be fixed. We're detecting the battery. We are um, actually we are. All right, so it just plugged in. It doesn't see the battery because our battery is not plugged in. Um, we'll take care of that after ultrasonic because it's, it's literally it's not plugged in so nothing to explain there but Yeah, this should be fixed um, and I hope this video uh, helps you solve your problem in some way if you come across a similar one of these machines We're starting to learn more and more about these M ones and um, I do think these are going to be much more repairable devices than the previous generation T2 and USB-C nonsense But we'll have to see so thank you for watching